thank you, uh, Fotis, um, and thank you everyone for making the time this morning. It's uh, it's great to uh, have the chance to um, spend some time with uh, uh, the ECHO team uh, that I, I find being a critical really um, collaboration and partnership in order to ensure um, uh, the best possible outcomes uh, for uh, mitral valve uh, surgery. And um, we are actually seeing also more expansion uh, in tricuspid work. Uh, so maybe there will be the opportunity to discuss that uh, in another uh, time, in another um, meeting as well. So um, I'm, I'm happy today to uh, go over some of uh, what the uh, potential challenges we may find when uh, tackling uh, some cases in a minimal invasive approach. Uh, however, I would like to stress that, um, and hopefully that will be the core message, that uh, the principles that we should follow uh, for repair uh, or the uh, challenges that we may face during repair are uh, actually not related to the approach. So as much as obviously we are trying to perform as many repairs as possible using a minimal invasive approach, in our program uh, has grown significantly. Uh, we are now the largest one in the GTA, um, and uh, it's it's continuing uh, to to grow. And as I mentioned, not only now for mitral cases, uh, first time surgeries. Now we will start also uh, performing uh, redo mitrals, and we have already started uh, with uh, tricuspid also in a redo setting. So it's really rapidly expanding. Uh, but the principles of repair uh, will be very similar, and I'll try to provide you with uh, some of the um, also intraoperative views uh, so that um, hopefully it will be possible to appreciate uh, what the surgeon uh, may see. And uh, I understand it may be uh, in some cases difficult to figure it out how to correlate with the echo images, but hopefully that will help over time, thanks also to this kind of uh, to these meetings, um, to uh, provide a better feedback about how that valve in the end, looks like um, when um, we are in the operating room. Um, uh, just, uh, I like to remind often also patients that, um, as you know, I'm, I'm very much involved also in the transcatheter side and minimal invasive cardiac surgery really has the ability to, I, I like often to say to merge potentially the best of, of, of both in the sense that uh, it, is, it is still a surgical procedure. I make sure that people understand there's nothing to do with the transcatheter one. Uh, however, it can provide the same reliability uh, that a conventional surgical procedure does, but uh, with a significant less impact and a very um, rapid recovery uh, post um, surgery. And uh, we have um, obviously started this program that is already covering mitral tricuspid arrhythmia or aortic valve, even if this morning we'll focus specifically, I would say only on the mitral valve. Um, again, just a brief reminder how the procedure is performed. Uh, we uh, have a, a very a small incision, um, often around like four centimeters, that is performed on the lateral chest wall. Um, and we most of the times no longer use even a retractor. We use uh, something called a soft tissue retractor, which minimizes the trauma to the ribs. Uh, so the incisions are way smaller than what they used to be I would say back in the days, like 20 years or so, when this kind of surgery started. Um, in fact, um, we uh, can sometimes see directly through the tiny hole, but most of the times, uh, and I regularly use this, we use endoscopes, which are tiny cameras that allow us to actually have a very clear and magnified view of the surgical field. And then we connect the patient uh, through a groin incision that is uh, key to insert the cannulas for the uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. And the impact is, is quite considerable because as you can see here, patients are, um, basically they have no clear visible scar, uh, only if you see on the side, there is a very small incision uh, that um, again, does not prevent patients from returning very quickly to their uh, daily activities. Um, just again, a few words before delving in some of the um, echo potential um, uh, questions. Um, Minimal invasive mitral surgery has not been widely performed in general in Canada. And um, obviously, sometimes there could be concerns or questions whether uh, it is uh, a safe procedure. And this is uh, actually a procedure that has been performed 
uh, especially in Europe, where you know I've been trained and worked uh, for almost two decades. And now I would say the vast majority of centers um, have been already been performing minimal invasive matter surgery uh, on a regular basis. And I'm quite confident that over the next five to 10 years, we will see a very significant shift also in Canada so that uh, most of the centers uh, will be able to offer that. And uh, minimal invasive matter surgery has proven to be very safe, also in very complex cases. This is a, a report uh, that um, I uh, co author with my uh, colleagues uh, from uh, former colleagues from Italy. As you can see, back in 2015, uh, some obviously uh, people may question whether it is safe also in very complex anatomies like Barlow's disease. And um, our group uh, back in Italy, along with many other groups, actually confirm and prove that even in complex scenarios, uh, the uh, use of a minimal invasive approach, even when facing complex anatomies, do not compromise the outcomes or the quality of the repair. And uh, in particular, as we are moving more into the some of the details of uh, how we approach these valves, um, I obviously would like to stress uh, the technique uh, that I uh, personally favor uh, in using, uh, which uh, is the use of cords. Um, I'm pretty sure you're very familiar that one of the most common techniques for surgical repair is the resection. That means the removal of the excessive tissue. Um, this is what typically is called a reset technique. And uh, uh, the cords um, is actually not a new uh, technique because it has been used again for roughly 15, 20 years, uh, also in, ster in sternotomy approaches, uh, but has gained more and more popularity. Um, and um, it is a, a very, um, very friendly technique, I find, because as we will uh, have an overview of what are the different forms of uh, mitral regurgitation and leaflet characteristics that we may face, the use of cords can actually help uh, mitigating differences and provide a technique that can be used in the vast majority of settings. I have to say that since I joined St. Michael's um, almost uh, like slightly more than two years ago, and I, I have been performing a, a fairly large number uh, of, of mitral repairs so far, I probably would say that 1% or less of the cases I perform has been a resection, and most of the cases have been uh, cords. Um, as well as uh, the edge-to-edge -edge technique. And as I'll mention, uh, this is uh, also the result of myself being part of the MitraClip team, uh, has actually made me uh, revalue and rediscover, in a sense, uh, the, uh, the use and the advantages of also the edge-to-edge -edge technique in uh, several instances. But for sure, I would say that the use of cords um, has been the uh, most uh, widely technique uh, in my hands, and in general, there has been an overall trend in a more a widespread use of cords. Um, one of the key uh, changing um, technical aspects has been that uh, for many years, um, we have been literally eyeballing the length of the uh, cords. And uh, over the past several years, uh, we have gone and moved into a more standardized length of cords. Um, to the point that in my personal practice, I always use, for example, a 16 millimeter cords uh, every time I deal with a posterior leaflet prolapse, regardless if it's affecting P2, P1, or P3. And um, we'll welcome some, some questions or discussion about that later. Um, one um, important aspect that I like to stress, and uh, for me is, is key, like many surgeons, Maybe not all of us, but like most of the surgeons, uh, especially mattress surgeons, are uh, you know having a preoperative echo um, in order to plan the technique for repair. And it's important because uh, um, the preoperative echoes, you know, uh, may provide you uh, some information, uh, not that much about the uh, the anatomy, which is obviously the same in the operating room, but sometimes about some jets, which may be more. Uh, pronounced uh, when the patient is awake rather than under um, general anesthesia. So um, it is something that um, on average uh, we tend to, to have as an important piece of information. And one of the key aspects has, has been that uh, assessing mitral valves um, on a surgical 
view. And as I will show you the videos uh, in the next few slides, I want you to uh, make sure to have this image always on the side, but if you keep in mind that this is the surgical view. It's basically a 3D view from the atrial side uh, in terms of echo imaging. And, and this is really a, an important uh, piece of information, not only the 3D, but the 2D with the systematic analysis as done here in the echo lab, uh, so that we can really understand uh, for the different segments if uh, there is pathology or the direction of the jet. Uh, this is very key because when the heart is obviously arrested and flaccid, the assessment has to be done by the surgeon, but as a sort of final verification of a dynamic assessment, which has been done on the echo. In other words, I strongly base my repair on what the echo sees, and I just make sure that there are no additional findings that may be missed, typically like a cleft on, on the echo. But otherwise, I find that the echo is extremely reliable. And when performing echo guided repair, the chances of success are extremely, extremely high. And uh, another aspect to keep in mind that, um, again, has been changing over the last, uh, I would say, decade or so is that, um, uh, as you know, when managing the, <clears throat> the analyst, uh, the analyst is in reality a sallow shape uh, structure. And uh, historically, surgeons have been using complete rings for degenerative disease. Um, it is still used in a large percentage of cases. Uh, many surgeons, including myself, are actually uh, using uh, bands, uh, which means uh, incomplete rings that are actually anchored from the trigon to the other trigon. And the reason is that the, typically the intertrigonal distance does not change uh, in degenerative disease. And by um, avoiding the complete ring, it could potentially contribute to a better mobility of the mitral valve uh, and thereby uh, improving function and reducing the likelihood uh, also of potential uh, SAM. Uh, just a few reminders that when we look at valve, uh, mitral valves, um, the uh, Carpentier classification is, is quite uh, helpful to understand where uh, really the mechanism um, uh, we are uh, dealing with is, is in like a type 1, type 2, or type 3. As you know, in the type 1 uh, um, mitral regurgitation, the leaflets are normal, and typically it's an annular dilatation or a leaflet perforation. I would say that uh, besides, obviously, endocarditis, um, when patient, for example, may have a functional, atrial functional uh, regurgitation, this is a uh, a, a typical case uh, where, in fact, the ring, uh, as you know, in atrial functional regurgitation works well, but it does not work well in ventricular functional regurgitation. We know that an annuloplasty alone will fail in terms of repair. And uh, you actually, from the echo side, you can see when there is atrial functional regurgitation, the leaflets are fairly horizontal, and really there is a coaptation gap but on our horizontal um, leaflets. Uh, instead of a functional mitral regurgitation where the leaflets are tethered in the ventricle. The type 2 obviously is the most common that we face with the um, uh, prolapsing segments in a single or multiple uh, scallops. And then we have the restricted motion, 3A or 3B, um, with uh, 3A being typically a uh, restricted motion uh, due to retraction, like in rheumatic disease uh, or uh, after some form of radiotherapy and um, uh, type 3B when there is a restricted motion due to apical displacement, uh, meaning um, a typical ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy. But what it's also important to remember is that even when we are talking about prolapses, uh, we may see, uh, you know, not all prolapses are in a sense created equal. Uh, this is, a, I like this slide because it really shows you how um, uh, the spectrum of the uh, degenerative disease in type 2 um, Carpentier classification might have a prolapse, so in presence uh, of, of prolapse uh, uh, segments, may go from fibroelastic deficiency uh, with uh, very thin leaflets um, and maybe just a single turn corda uh, to uh, more advanced forms where there is also excess of tissue. Uh, to now uh, more generous tissue in mostly located in one segment into more extensive disease like viral disease. So it's really um, very important to, to remember how this may be different from one to the other. And this is also one of the reasons why um, it's important for surgeons, obviously, to have 
different techniques for repair and and also different understanding what the options may be uh, uh, the presence for example of a fiber elastic deficiency leaves not many options in terms of surgical technique for repair because one may attempt for example a resection here uh, or in this other form but especially if you have very thin leaflets uh, you may be left with not enough tissue to be sewn back together or very frail tissue that may actually not be sutured back together so a resection potentially could be not the ideal solution for this case uh, and cords uh, would be um, advantageous. On the opposite side, barlow disease, where there is a, a strong excess of uh, significant excess of tissue, um, uh, there is obviously concern that non-resecting the tissue may lead to potential displacement of the coaptation line variant here and thereby risk of sound. However, with the techniques that we are now using for cords, um, my, including myself, uh, many surgeons are using cords and still not facing that potential risk uh, as we have evolved how we are using cords. Uh, so overall, it's important to have different uh, tools. And, and also, obviously, we need to consider that the anal dilatation may be uh, present in different fashion in one form to the other. Typical in fiber elastic deficiency, the anuli are not significantly dilated unlike in Barlow disease. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the echo-guided repair is, is key so that we can really uh, have a clear map and plan in our head by combining obviously the 2D images and the 3D images um, in order to uh, predict where the uh, problem is or the problems are located and how to tackle that. There are other forms of more advanced reconstruction uh, like a, in this case, uh, done like a software, like the mitral uh, valve uh, navigator. Uh, I have to say I found mixed results with this because if the uh, acquisition is not done properly, you may really get quite misleading um, information from this kind of uh, reconstruction. So even with a combination of the 2D, the 3D, and as we have right now, like the true view or the glass function, I think we really have already many tools that can reliably guide also our um, plan for uh, mitral repair. And definitely for most of us, uh, we, we strongly um, uh, rely on the uh, echo uh, assessment. Um, and um, uh, another aspect that I wanted to mention it, it was regarding the uh, standardized quarter length, meaning that um, for many years, we, as I mentioned, we eyeballed uh, the length of the cords uh, for the matter of a repair, uh, which could also lead uh, over time in issues like uh, once the remodeling of the ventricle has occurred, a certain cord uh, may have become now too long and thereby there could be recurrent regurgitation. So um, there have been different uh, uh, approaches uh, uh, to um, find the right length of the cord. I personally, as a, a, I mentioned maybe this before, uh, I, I use uh, a, and I measure uh, for uh, several cases uh, when I started uh, uh, more than uh, two years and a half ago using this approach um, of uh, 60 millimeters. I uh, very diligently set with the Echo Lab. I was still working in Kingston at the time. And then we, we start measuring uh, with uh, all the different, um, um, uh, you know, orientations and, and angles, uh, the uh, potential length and the number 16, uh, kept coming back uh, and I then started to use uh, empirically in all cases. And I have to say, I've been uh, quite uh, pleased uh, with the outcomes. And, and really it's, it's important because it provides also from the uh, technical standpoint, a very structured way, especially when we are minimal invasive that uh, we go in, we open the atrium and we go straight away in placing the cords and in uh, potentially um, addressing the repair minimizing the um, uh, cross current time and thereby the potential damage uh, to the heart. Uh, another very important uh, parameter that I would like to stress is the uh, prediction of the residual valve area. Um, we as surgeons uh, have been historically a bit skeptical in using the edge-to-edge -edge technique, which obviously is the key for the mitral clip approach for a percutaneous uh, transcatheter repair. Um, and as I alluded before, uh, my 
presence among the uh, MitraClip team has really changed how I see uh, the, um, the use of an edge-to-edge -edge technique from surgery. Um, I can now very, uh, you know, uh, happily go to the operating room, uh, understanding that um, if we place uh, an XDW with a certain width of typically a couple based on a, a baseline area, I uh, can reasonably be uh, reassured that if I perform uh, a certain uh, length of edge to edge uh, with suture in the operating room and there is a certain baseline area, the patient will not experience uh, a um, mitral stenosis. Um, so uh, my maybe strong recommendation is that uh, this parameter, which I would say it's present uh, in the vast majority, if not all uh, patients um, that even are, are coming for mitral valve surgery, uh, I would again uh, encourage to ensure that all patients are having this uh, measurement provided um, because it will um, provide an important uh, uh, information and prediction for potential stenosis. Um, even if we're not using primarily an edge-to-edge -edge technique for repair, in case we want to use as a bailout, we know already we can safely use it or not. And um, other parameters that are obviously um, important and uh, it could help um, providing us more guidance is obviously the uh, C-sept distance, uh, which, as you know, um, is uh, an important uh, one, one of the predictors of the important predictors uh, for potential um, SAM post repair, as well as the aortic mitral angle. And this is an example of uh, now I'll, I'll move into some some videos uh, for uh, surgical uh, procedures uh, where uh, you will see also the appearance of the leaflets and and what we uh, how we tackled um, uh, the different. Uh, uh, features um, in, in different cases. Uh, this is a, a, a typical example of a very extensive uh, Barlow disease. Um, uh, I'm, I'm holding here the posterior leaflet and I'm uh, pointing here and you can see uh, the on the left side of the slide the presence of a um, let me see if I can use um, so you can see the um, anterior leaflet uh, that is now um, uh, exposed. Uh, now on the flaccid heart uh, in a condition like this one, it would become virtually very challenging trying to understand which segment uh, would be mostly responsible for a uh, regurgitation. And the probably most immediate reaction would be just to uh, move towards a um, replacement. Um, and this is why, um, in this case, uh, the preoperative assessment uh, that was done with the TE helped guide it um, where the suture uh, for the edge-to-edge -edge, uh, was going to be placed. And uh, uh, here we are tying the sutures. So this the suture was not like randomly placed, but was placed only after a... Um, echo analysis um, and was, was performed. And you can see here, uh, this is the anterior leaflet, this is the posterior leaflet. You can see the rim of suture here. You have to imagine the valve is slightly rotated with the camera in this case, but uh, uh, you can see there is no residual regurgitation and the repair was possible thanks to a preoperative uh, planning. Um, this is a, um, an, a now an example of a P2 prolapse, a focal one. Uh, performing a minimal invasive approach. Uh, here we are exposing the valve. Uh, and as you will see in the next few videos, um, you could actually argue that the, the view and the uh, definition of the mitral valve analysis is actually way better in minimal invasive thanks to these cameras we have than with uh, uh, our naked eye. So here we are holding the posterior leaflet. Again, this is the exposure. So you got the anterior leaflet on the front. You can see here the rupture cord. So this is an example of a valve that has uh, just a very limited focal problem of P2. And here, just to give you an understanding uh, how uh, it, this is still labeled as a P2 prolapse, but you understand how different it looks like uh, once uh, you get into the operating room. This is a very, very extensive prolapse of P2. In the previous case, 
despite the thickness of the tissue was, was um, normal, it was mostly uh, an isolated ruptured cord. In this case, you have a very extensive um, involvement of the posterior leaflet, plus uh, there are also, uh, you know, there is also a significant height, increased height of the posterior leaflet, which again could lead to um, anterior displacement of the coaptation and thereby risk uh, for SAM. So here we are first uh, um, uh, actually targeting some of the deep indentation in the leaflet, and then we are uh, placing some of the cords. These are the, the new cords, so the new um, cords that are uh, positioned in the body, in the free edge, actually, uh, close uh, uh, to the free edge of the leaflet. And, uh, and, and what's, what's important is that once the, the valve has been, uh, uh, the ring has been placed, now you can see the appearance and the height of the, uh, of the posterior leaflet has now been restored with uh, a normal ratio. And it's important because you, you can appreciate that these uh, cords uh, are able to basically pull down the leaflet. And what's also important, and, and probably you've seen uh, in, in a good number of cases uh, on the postoperative echo, um, the postoperative uh, coaptation length, it's usually fairly uh, significant, which is uh, in general a good predictor for, um, for durability of the repair. Uh, this is an example of a P1 prolapse, just showing you how this same technique can be used also when the problems are not typically centrally located, but both when they are uh, more lateral or medial. So in this case, we have a P1 prolapse. and um, and again, uh, same technique and approach. So we're putting these cords. It is really becoming a technique that helps um, improving also the um, how easy it can be to teach this approach uh, to surgeons, given uh, how standardized uh, this, this can become. And again, here you can see a nice result of the uh, repair uh, for this uh, lateral uh, issue. In this case, we have a uh, P3 prolapse and as well as an A2. Um, so again, these are the different loops of cords. I'll just quickly move over here. That are positioned first on the posterior leaflet and then on the anterior leaflet. And again, at the end, uh, the, the valve has a nice uh, repair. Now, I like I like to show you also this case. Um, of uh, a fairly significant barlow disease. And uh, for uh, your uh, probably um, typical, uh, you know, uh, analysis uh, that would start with an echo. Um, and um, I, I have both the preoperative as well as the intraoperative images. So you can appreciate here uh, how, you know, extensive the involvement was uh, for both leaflets. One would have argued uh, looking at the mobility of the anterior leaflet that um, a dedicated anterior leaflet um, strategy should also be done to reduce the mobility since the anterior leaflet was actually prolapsing uh, um, above the um, annular plane. And you also see uh, the important curling of the posterior leaflet uh, with, uh, um, you know, an overall uh, reduce, uh, very much reduces sept uh, and uh, the, the leaflet uh, very uh, close to the uh, septum. Um, and this is the uh, 3D view with and without color. What's interesting here, and I'll, I'll mention again, is the fact that most of the times it can be challenging uh, for the echo to maybe detect uh, certain deep indentations will become more obvious in the operating room. But what's actually very good is that for us as surgeons, it's extremely easy to f uh, fix indentations because it just requires a very simple suture. It's a challenge for clips, but not for surgical repair. And um, so the major potential issues obviously are the length of the anterior leaflet, the susceptible distance and the orthomitral angle. And this is the view of the same valve that you just saw the echo uh, once you're in the operating room. So you see the anterior leaflet, uh, fairly long and redundant, but you definitely the uh, significant um, amount of tissue in the posterior leaflet. And I'm holding here with the forceps what appears to be like a, a indentation here 
uh, in the body of PIG2. So at first we addressed uh, that indentation by suturing uh, uh, the body of P2, and then we place the usual cords. And then as you can see here, uh, we just by putting cords on the posterior leaflet in a very large ring, we were actually able to restore a normal coaptation, a normal ratio, and there was no more evidence of um, prolapse. And what's also most important, there was no evidence of uh, SAM. So you can see here the very long coaptation um, in the in this mitral valve, um, and um, in the end the coaptation was about one centimeter. Uh, the gradient was uh, was around three with uh, just trace mitral regurgitation. Uh, so um, the uh, really in conclusion, uh, the key points I find are that the echo guidance uh, is key for. Uh, a successful uh, surgical uh, uh, planning of the repair. It's very important to keep in mind and identify the main and most critical predictors of potential uh, SAM. It's also important to stress that the mitral valve area is a key parameter also for surgical cases um, in obviously uh, the occurrence that a, a potential um, edge to edge is uh, going to be performed. Um, um, we are seeing also in the mitral clipboard, but there obviously uh, also patients that may come to surgery that uh, patients with thickened leaflets uh, may actually be exposed to high risk of gradients. It's uh, less likely to happen with the technique of repair we use given that we do not perform routinely and exclusively an edge to edge, but this is something again to keep in mind because it may be a factor that may guide us to steer away in certain cases from a um, edge to edge technique also in surgery. And unfortunately, as you know, we, we, we are learning also from the uh, mitral clip word that in some cases we end up non-implanting when even if the area is uh, borderline or, or on the safe range, but when the, the leaflets appear to be significantly uh, thickened. And overall, um, this is really an important uh, an exciting time for mitral valve repair surgery because, as I said, uh, we are seeing a significant also uh, change uh, and, in a sense, a sort of paradigm shift with uh, in repair. Uh, historically, we've uh, we've been doing more likely resections with smaller rings, and now we are trying to move in many instances uh, on techniques that incorporate a, a use of a very large ring, non-resectional techniques and at the same time trying to provide a very significant uh, co-optation length. So I'll stop here uh, so that there is some time for discussion. And again, thanks for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Bisleri. That was a fantastic talk. And I love seeing those intraoperative uh, images. You just, you just I, I say this, so, you know, in the Echo Lab, we see things, everything in black and white, but you guys are seeing it uh, in Technicolor. So uh, it's, uh, it's quite nice. Um, I'll open the uh, floor to any questions, please. If you guys want, uh, just put up your hand or unmute yourselves and, uh, and ask Dr. Pizzleri any questions you might have. John is Howard. That was that was fantastic. Always great to see um, to see some pictures from the OR. At, uh, you know that pathological correlation um, that um, uh, that, uh, that, we, that 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 we that we get uh, really makes us appreciate uh, sort of uh, what we see on echocardiography. It helps build our um, build our skill set. Can you can you tell us that obviously the the approach is is, is generally is is obviously through the left atrium. So you have a good aspect of the atrial, a good look at the atrial aspect of the mitral leaflets. Tell us about the challenges of 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 attaching the cords to the to the pap muscles and 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 uh, some of those aspects. So the distal end of the of the of the neo cords. No, it's actually uh, you're actually raising a very good point. Uh, so thanks, Howard. Um, so I have to say that uh, we now have uh, um, some tricks that we have developed uh, in order to expose. Uh, the papillary muscle heads. Uh, we uh, place this. Um, uh, it's 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 funny because it's actually a ruler, uh, a plastic ruler that uh, if you fold it and then you release, it actually unfolds and open the orifice of the mitral valve. So it's a very cheap and effective solution to have a wonderful exposure of the subvalvular apparatus. 
And this is uh, also very, very important because uh, um, I guess to your question, one of the key uh, potential rules that uh, has to be respected is where do you anchor the cords? Uh, there is almost like a rule that um, uh, you should never pass uh, the midline. So you typically have the papillary muscles uh, for problems that are uh, located like a more P2, P3 or P1, P2. Um, and you can, for example, if it's a P2, P3 problems, uh, so more medial problem, you cannot anchor the uh, neocords to the lateral one because otherwise you will be stretching and creating a restriction uh, to the papillary muscle. So the first thing actually that I normally do, uh, regardless if the, um, the problem, for example, is medial to blindly go to the um, uh, papillary muscle that is obviously mostly medial, I actually have an inspection of the subvalvular apparatus because sometimes uh, it's unpredictable. You may find an additional tiny papillary muscle head and you can actually appreciate most of the times that there is uh, the rupture cords that were responsible for the flail. So in, in such case, always go for, for gold because in, that is where you have to, to attach the cords. Um, the, uh, the other important aspect that has changed um, uh, with the use of this technique is that back in the days, we used to do, uh, for example, uh, multiple passages of these uh, cords um, into the papillary muscle heads, which A, could have been traumatic to the papillary muscle head, uh, B, sometimes they were fairly uh, you know, thin and there was no space. Uh, and now we have a different approach where we have just one single anchoring suture, and then we have these three cords, or you can put three or four, usually are three, that are already uh, coming towards the, um, the the leaflet. So you basically have to work and pass everything just once in the papillary muscle head, and then everything can be uh, very nicely um, anchored on the leaflet. I personally recall probably, uh, I don't know, a couple of cases where the ventricles were so massively dilated that uh, it was not possible to visualize uh, the papillary muscle head safely and thereby I went back to use the uh, resection technique, uh, but otherwise it's a fairly applicable approach. Uh, I have a quick question, Dr. Bazzari. Uh, so um, your approach through the left atrium, uh, is that a simple left atrial uh, incision, or do you also take that opportunity to do stuff through the left atrial appendage or left atrial appendage ligation? Like, is there any... Is there any benefit to that with or without atrial fibrillation? Like, is there any talk about how that approach changes things? No, it, it is a great question. Uh, so the approach um, is often, um, I know it's a, it's not an issue uh, for, for you guys, but like what I explain to patients that we go through the right, we always think, yeah, yeah, you mean left. And then, no, no, I mean right. Because uh, we actually, as a typically, like uh, the, the approach is still the same that you would do in sternotomy when we're talking about the atrium. Uh, which is the interator groove. So it's a direct left atrial approach. Um, the approach is done through the right thoracotomy because that is actually providing a perfect straight view and shot to the mitral valve. So in, in a sense, uh, when you're doing a minimal invasive approach for the record, you are stretching the atrium less than what you do in sternotomy. Because if you think about the orientation of the, of the mitral valve and the atrium, when you're doing sternotomy, you have to pull that way up so that you're actually seeing from the top. But when you're coming from the side, you're not really lifting or stretching too much. That approach is extremely versatile because it allows us to, uh, to your point and to your question, to perform also additional procedures. A, we have a very nice view of the uh, left atrial appendage. So uh, a good percentage of patients that are coming for mitral surgery do have atrial fibrillation and in many cases, uh, they are good candidates to receive a concomitant ablation of atrial fibrillation, which is a, a maze procedure, which means an ablation performed internally with a cryo energy. So it's a fairly extensive ablation uh, that doesn't actually take too long. It, it adds only roughly 10, 12 minutes to the cross gun time. So it's not causing any harm, but it leads to significant advantages. So through the same approach, we can perform the left and um, ablation, as well as the closure of the appendage. Uh, using the same approach, minimal invasive, we also can do tricuspid valves. And in fact, uh, we have done cases also where we've done left 
um, treatment like mitral ablation and then tricuspid all combined. So it's it's very versatile. Obviously, for the right atrium, it's a different incision, but um, through the same minimal invasive approach, we can tackle both. Fascinating. Thank you. So I saw a question here, if you don't mind, uh, Fotis uh, from Patrick that is asking, what's the usual delay of recovery after minimal invasive you recommend patients uh, for returning back to work? I think it's it's a great question because uh, um, one of the key advantages is uh, for minimal invasive is the fact that uh, the precautions that are typically um, uh, you know brought forward for a conventional approach are not there for a minimal invasive one. First of all, uh, when we have all the different, and we're actually working on a on a pathway because uh, you know minimal invasive is not just what happens in the operating room or the size of the incision. It's more uh, it's 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 overall a pathway. Uh, so we are actually working to have expedited discharges for these patients, and we've seen in the vast majority of cases we are able to discharge these patients sooner um, than what we do with a conventional approach. The usual recommendation uh, in terms of physical limitations. I tend to recommend like a 10 days, uh, 14 days uh, of like limited, you know, activities with the arms just to still give some time for the wound to heal, even if no bone is obviously uh, divided. Uh, but literally uh, by month number one, I can tell you that younger patients um, have been going back to go to the gym, to do push-ups. Uh, I had patients uh, coming and asking me if I, we could have gone back to ski. Uh, so. Uh, it's really no limitation in terms of activity. It's it's fairly impressive uh, compared to what would happen with a uh, conventional approach, even if the patient is recovering fine, because there is the usual delay of six to eight weeks before they go back using fully bare arms, it overall delays the recovery as a whole. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. So I appreciate that you have mitral clips to get to. So if there aren't any... Uh, well, photos, photos Bob oh, Dr. Parker, yeah. yeah. So just, um, John, great talk. Thank you. Um, papillary muscles. I mean, I, I must say that outside of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where we actually look for them and look where they are, we don't actually spend a lot of time looking at the papillary muscles in these kinds of cases. So it suggests to me that you're not seeing much variability in terms of anatomy, in terms of where are they? How many are there of them? You, you know, that they're kind of where they're supposed to be because, you know, you're not coming to the lab saying, well, you, you know, the papillary wasn't where it should have been or there was an extra one or something like that. Because clearly it's important that they're there and they're in the right place for you to do those uh, those uh, synthetic ports. No, Rob, it, it's actually a great question. And um, my answer is uh, going to be that we are lacking surgery that we see, um, uh, we see basically uh, very easily uh, the variability and we do not record the variability. And the point you're actually raising, it's very important because uh, I am... Uh, I'm very, uh, you know, I, I'm so much in, uh, you know, fascinated and, and in love with this technique of repair that also for catheter approaches, I'm constantly poking Neil because uh, uh, there is a, an approach that is evolving and hopefully at some point we should be able to start with, with a transeptal transcatheter approach where uh, we may be placing cords rather than clipping. Uh, Obviously, <laughs> by all means, nobody is claiming that uh, uh, this may, uh, you know, becoming um, mainstream as, as the clip. Uh, and again, I'm talking when you're going to be doing that in a catheter-based approach, you need to have a clear map of where to go. So it is actually, uh, it's, it, it is going to be, uh, in, I think, a problem that we'll need to face in the future because uh, uh, I feel that it's probably going to be not different than what we see with the track caspid. Um, not that much. It, it has nothing to do with the with the papillary muscles, but the anatomy. As surgeons, we have seen, you know, as you know, plenty of track caspid valves. But if you ask a surgeon uh, in general how many leaflets, you just mentioned about 
screen. What's what's the question? But I now spent enough time in the Echo Lab, um, sorry, in the Calf Lab when we were doing tricuspid clips that you know that the the least percentage of patients have only truly free uh, free leaflets. So um, it is actually uh, something that. Uh, uh, and then, in fact, we, we have seen challenges where we are doing tricuspid clip, how we're actually going to be positioning and orienting. So to your point, um, luckily for surgery at this stage, we can figure it out when we see that in, in real life in, in the OR with uh, direct vision. But it may become actually a big question once we start doing these approaches in a catheter, and we will. Fantastic. Uh, if there's no more questions, then uh, Dr. Bisleri, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate having you here. And uh, we look forward to your tricuspid talk when that time comes.